Welcome back, everyone. We are wrapping up theCUBE's live coverage of MWISE here in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-hosts and analysts. We have John Furrier and Rob Strecce. We are joined by Phil Venables. He is the CISO at Google Cloud. Thank you so much for coming on theCUBE, Phil. No, always a pleasure to be here. Yeah. yeah. So the conversation at MWISE has really centered around the enormous potential of artificial intelligence and the need for uh, businesses and the government and academic institutions to work together to make sure that this is going to, 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 to reach its potential. How is Google thinking about AI and cybersecurity? A very broad question to begin, but right. how, do you, how do you look well, at this? Well, first of all, it's kind of fascinating because you know, when everybody's thinking about kind of the potential of AI, from our perspective, we've been making heavy use of AI for a <laughs> long, long time. Uh, maybe not the generative AI that's come about in the past few years, but traditional deep learning has been the foundation of many of our products, whether you're a Gmail user getting malware filtering and spam filtering, or whether you're a Chrome user and having uh, the safe browsing experience. All of that is a, an AI-based system using conventional deep learning. But certainly since we uh, you know, invented the transformer technology in 2018, we've been building on that with generative AI yeah. approaches. And we think the potential for this is huge. I mean, just focusing yeah. on, on the security potential, what we've already demonstrated with the ability to take virus total data, Mandiant threat data, Google threat data, and use that to analyze threats, to support the cybersecurity workforce, to drive automated detections. You know, we're just at the beginning and already it's proving a significant boon to defenders. Phil, one of the things that we've been talking about, you were on our SuperCloud 3 cyber program we just did, also we were at Google Next, we were joking on our wrap up there, we were drunk on AI because it was so exciting. Google had a lot of stuff com coming out in products, okay, great. We've been so focused on what AI will do for the businesses, creating a, a creative culture, more heavy lifting, kind of abstracted away with AI, that we've kind of forgot, well at least I can speak for myself, took my eye off the ball on how do you secure AI? So here, what we're seeing in the threat landscape is AI is good for cybersecurity, but also it's more about securing AI, and certainly in DC, even this week, more hearings are going on around, uh, around what is AI, do we regulate it? AI as an opportunity, but at the same time, you got to secure it. Mm. What's your vision on, what's Google's position on that? How are you thinking about it? How should practitioners think about securing AI, at least today and then going forward? Well, it's interesting, because as a company, you may have heard us talk about our approach to AI is about being bold and responsible. <laughs> and everything we've done, whether it's in the security space, the consumer space, all across the business, is about being innovative driving these things but being responsible while doing so and that includes many things, security, risk management, compliance, safety, a whole array of things but particularly on the security of AI rather than AI for security, it's a whole array of things and we're certainly partnering with a lot of organizations to think about how to deploy what we published with our secure AI framework, how to think about not just the security of the AI system, but the protection of the data, the protection of the surrounding ecosystem, how you deploy AI with guards that make sure it's operating correctly. And this is a fantastic challenge for security teams yeah. because they not only have to think about this as um, a secure software lifecycle, they have to think about the end-to-end -end data governance of the training data, the model weights, the test data, how you keep this yeah. thing tuned and, uh, and monitored for safety and security. Uh, and this is something that yeah. I think security teams, in partnership with their risk and compliance teams and many other teams, are going to have to build <laughs> a bigger practice around security of AI. As a CISO, um, the psychology is do more, do more, do more, 10x data, 100x more data. Budgets aren't increasing by that much, but the threats are, you see more zero days out in the wild, living off the land. Is there a modernization opportunity with AI? Because you know, we've heard from CISOs and others, Antoine was on theCUBE yesterday saying, you know, some of them, he was joking, they're in the 90s using databases, so talking about SOCs, you know, secure operations. So DevSecOps is here. How do the CISOs modernize while the plane's flying at 35,000 feet, they got to swap out the engine, so to speak. This is a challenge, so you got to maintain the defense, yet modernize more tools than ever before? Well, it's, it's a timely question because we often encourage people to think about, and again, not just for security teams, but for boards, executives, CIOs, chief technology officers, the path to better security is to modernize your technology to a more defendable platform where security is built in, not bolted on. 
and, and a big part of that transformation can be accelerated through the use of AI technology. So some of our products we've announced that we call Duet helps people build more secure code, it helps people build more secure cloud configurations, it helps people do the migration yeah. and they can accelerate the cloud quicker. And the same goes for many of our security teams as well, where you know when you look at the security teams, if they want to get to a more advanced detection platform, they can get there quicker with AI because the AI assist gives them that 10x productivity to do the transformation. But certainly it is, yeah. it is I won't diminish, it's a challenge yeah. for teams to go through the learning curve, but when they've applied that, I think they can get there quicker with some of the AI solutions. So looking at the Google Secure AI framework, I, I mean, one of my favorite things is S-bombs. I don't know why, but I, I just <laughs> love the word. And I, I just, it, is that what we're, is that the road we're going down with AI is, hey, you're going to have the supply chain, know where your models are coming from, where your data is, because I could see, and we talked about it earlier in the week, that injecting misinformation into an LLM could be you know, catastrophic to an organization. Yep. Well, I, th no, I think it is a good analogy, because when you think about an, uh, a, a foundation model with training with customer specific data, you're thinking about not just the software supply chain that surrounds that, but the data supply yeah. chain of what came into that. And so I think, you know, we, as part of the framework, we talk about model cards and data cards, which are transparent descriptions of how the model was built, trained, tested, how the data was sourced. Now those are important ingredients. But I think it's interesting with the S-bomb analogy, so you may be familiar with what we did with Salsa, right. which is the supply, uh, sof, uh, supply chain levels for software artifacts, which is a complement to, to the S-bomb approach. <clears throat> and you don't just need the ingredients, you need the process to build it securely. And one of the great things I think we've done, and I see other companies doing it as well, is building an AI platform that encompasses that end-to-end -end life cycle and the controls to make it easier for companies that don't have a large amount of expertise to get that high degree of control end-to-end -end from the data to the model. And I think that's, that's the way to go. And, and, and part of it, and companies are always I, I would say skeptical, and we've seen it from a end user perspective. I was talking to some at the bar last night and talking about how they're already doing tagging, they're already doing stuff within their security landscape. How do you, what do you tell them about how they're going to be able to use that data and keep it secure in Google? Because they're all, you know, everybody's like, hey, you know, I, I want to know it. my data is my data and it's here and right. it's secure. Well, I think, you know, we've spent a lot of time innovating on that where you've got a foundation model and then you've got the data that a customer organization will bring in an adapter layer to be able to provide their specific data to tune that model for their particular corporate purpose or their use case. And that data does not come back into, you know, get main model. polluted into our main model, it's kept isolated. And we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we make sure that that is a high assurance barrier. And so nobody wants their data to end up via a model into somebody else's uh, queries, and so we keep that very, very separate, and I think that, you'll see over time, I would think, more of the AI companies have that kind of barrier and that assurance, and uh, and this is why it's very, very useful for companies to use a, an enterprise-ready AI platform that's been battle-tested and designed for safety. All right, makes sense. One of the things that's really been clear from this conference is that no organization is safe. I mean, we've heard from Barracuda Networks, Microsoft, Coinbase, MGM, there's so many examples of companies that have, that have faced these cyber threats. Are there any sectors or industries or organization types that are more prone to these kinds of threats in your estimation? Well, look, I, I, the way I look at this is most, I agree, like no organization can ever be 100% invulnerable. You know, you <laughs> can get progressively close to that with investment and assurance and the combination of prevention, detection, and many other attributes. But there are plenty of organizations that are more vulnerable, but back to that point before where they've, they've just not modernized. They're operating on legacy infrastructure that wasn't designed for security. They're maybe not keeping that legacy infrastructure up to date. And they're just using technology that wasn't designed for the threats that we see today, which is, you know, why we think it's really important for people to modernize to a more defendable platform. Phil, one of the things everyone, well we know, we're in Silicon Valley and, and, and the industry, we're kind of inside the ropes with theCUBE. Google's well known for publishing the papers, even everything across the board from the Hadoop, MapReduce days to all the deep learning, you mentioned a few of those. 
Google's deep with machine learning for many years. Everyone kind of knows that. What's the secure AI framework paper that you guys put out this past summer? What was the motivation? Was it a collection of best practices? Uh, and for those watching, the secure AI framework that was published in June, I think June roughly. Yep, yep. It's, it, it's a well-documented piece of work. What was the motivation? Was it to share? Was it to to put it out there for practitioners? Was well, a collection you know, of best it, practices? It was, it was really a little bit in that there was a lot of dialogue going on in the uh, AI industry around security. Very kind of detailed technical information about you know, threats to AI, whether it's poisoning, extraction, all of these other, and it's all really important stuff, and we documented and written about a lot of that. But what we saw that was missing was that you know, a framework to enable companies to get their arms around just how to build these things and how to establish the governance and the control and the testing frameworks. And we didn't really see anything yeah. that, that, that covered that. There was some reasonable work with some of the NIST standards yeah. and some of the other emerging standards, but we thought putting together a practical framework that people could use based on our real world experience of how <laughs> we operate internally yeah. was just going to be a useful contribution. And we, we, you know, we've since published some implementations guides about how people can get their teams together. And we've also published some um, additional documentation on how to run red yeah. teams for AI. And so gradually our, our philosophy is as we're building yeah. up and have built up our experience in this, yeah. we're going to keep sharing it. We're clearly going to keep embedding it in product, yeah. but we also want to educate people about how to do this. It's a great document for folks watching. Check out that uh, secure AI framework that they put out in June. Um, this brings me back to our favorite point of, um, we, love to, we love sports as well in theCUBE. But, but the CISO is like a tech athlete. We hear varsity game, we heard Kevin say, the Chinese now varsity sport, they're the top, top team, apex, competitor, hacker. For CISOs, the game is fast. It's pro level, whole nother pace of play. What does CISOs and practitioners need to do to be a better uh, player? in the game, obviously the framework's out there. In your experience, as the game evolves, what can people do to be better up their game for themselves and their team? Well, so it's interesting, so I, I like the kind of the team sports analogy, because <laughs> a lot of us for years have said, you know, cyber is a team, is a team sport. And there's many constructs in the yeah. industry, whether it's ISACs, professional associations, great events yeah. like here at Mandy and MYs where the big value is, you know, outside the presentations, the yeah. networking in the halls, the you know, the sharing of the battle scars and the yeah. battle stories. <laughs> but, but I think really the, the big thing I find for CISOs is, you know, to up their game, it's about not taking on so much individually that recognize that a CISO is a is a senior executive in a company. And no senior executive in any role in any company takes everything on themselves. They work with their peer executives, whether it's the CFO, the chief risk officer, the CIO, other business leaders, and they figure out a way of getting shared responsibility and shared accountability, and they work together on these things. So I think CISOs talk a lot, you know, some parts of the CISO community talk a lot about the stress and the pressure of the job. You know, clearly it is a yeah. stressful job, but most C-level jobs yeah. are pretty stressful. <laughs> Most senior leadership jobs in the public sector yeah. and in the government and the DOD, they're all yeah. stressful jobs. But the way you make it less stressful yeah. is by not taking it all on yourself, by sharing it with and making it a shared accountability among the leadership team. The stakes are high. I mean, yep. pressure is there, but that's not why it's not a department anymore. It's, it's not an IT subgroup. Yeah, exactly. It's the thing. <laughs> yeah, yep. well and, and again this comes back to, and I know I keep harping on about this, about it's about technology modernization and having a platform yeah. that the CISOs have a better chance of securing. Um, and if, you, if the CISO is just going to get given a, lo a lot of money and the IT department has no money, then they're going to build and buy a bunch of cyber solutions and deploy it on a foundation of sand. So yeah. you've got to invest in cyber, but you've got to invest in your technology platform and your business processes and your mission systems. Yeah. Yeah, it would seem that there was a lot of discussion over over this course of this week also about the social engineering aspect of it and how that's really, and, and to me, it, it would seem like, and I, I think somebody mentioned it yesterday, it may have been on the panel you were on or not, but it was around the fact of people using like deep fakes and stuff like that as part of their social engineering. Are you seeing from a threat landscape that that's really, one of the things that people just need to be aware of, of how hard it is to defend against 
this social engineering aspect. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, we're seeing the early indicators of that, and you know, as the phrase goes, you know, the future's already here, it's just yeah. unevenly distributed, <laughs> so I think we're going to see more of that. But the way I look at this is, sometimes there's a temptation to think about, you know, we've got AI threats, and we're going to have to have AI to counter that, which I think is true in many respects, but when you look at some of these social engineering threats and some of these phishing threats and other things, I think the answer to that is not necessarily you know, how to counter those attacker tactics, it's how to just change the ball game entirely. And for example, using strong phishing resistant cryptographic authentication tokens, having different levels of control, so you're less vulnerable to phishing entirely, not just less vulnerable to AI driven phishing. And I, right. I think we all have to think about how do we de defeat whole classes of attacks, not just the evolution of specific attacks. No, that makes sense. There's a lot of talk about AI and the future of work and the job dislocation that will come with that, but I'm, I'm wondering what you think about AI's impact on the cybersecurity workforce and whether or not it will, it will make an impact on the unfilled jobs in, in the industry. Yeah. Well, I think it will. I mean, I think it, it does in two regards. One is it, um, it helps organizations scale their workforce. And so I, you know, I've often talked about, we, we clearly have a cybersecurity jobs challenge but actually, I think we need to solve that by 10xing the productivity of the people we've got, as well as trying to find more cybersecurity professionals. And AI certainly helps amplify the productivity of teams by reducing the toil, by providing assistance to their job. But the other thing as well is I think it amplifies talent. So the great thing about the AI assistance to certain roles, whether it's in security operations or whether it's in software development, certainly provides a scaling in skills as well as capacity. You can take a person that's maybe kind of entry level and with an AI assist they have some capability that gets them up the skills ramp quicker and then you can maybe take somebody that's kind of mid-level and have them functioning near expert level because they've been they've had that capability augmentation from the AI. So I think I'm, I'm on the whole very, very positive the fact that this is going to amplify and solve some of that challenge but we've clearly got a few years to go in the maturity of the tooling so I'm not you know, I'm not, I'm not unrealistic <laughs> about this is at the very early stages of not this. Not tomorrow. But early, you know, early signs are it's going to be very, very positive to just you know, help us you know, deal with the productivity issues that will help the workplace challenge. What's your opinion on the asymmetry aspect of it? Because that come, came up as well, Rob, right. yesterday. The balance between the, the kind of the metaphor. Well, they're sitting on the couch, the offense just throws a few things out there and then everyone has to respond on the other side. Does that take down the asymmetry work? Well, needed so or not. Yeah, well, so it's interesting when you think about, so clearly the use of AI can benefit attackers and as well as it can benefit defenders. I think all of us are focused on is how do we make sure AI is benefiting the defenders more than the yeah. attackers and how do we make sure that gets faster and better so we can keep driving that ahead. Uh, you know, I think you could kind of analyze about what's the logic behind AI will benefit defenders more than attackers. I think some of it comes down yeah. to the fact that if you can feed your organization's proprietary data into the AI defensive system, you're going to have more capability than yeah. an attacker likely would have, yeah. assuming that the attacker doesn't also have access to all of your yeah. data and they you know, even in, I, in, even in attacks, they generally don't have that ahead of time. So yeah. I think there's, there's reason to believe that it would be a true statement over time that yeah. AI for defense moves ahead of AI for attackers. But again, we're yeah. at the very early stages of the evolution of this, and I've learned over, sadly learned over many, many years that you can, you know, you can possibly predict what comes next, yeah. but what comes after what comes next is, uh, is, is inherently it's unpredictable. A, it's, and we're living in interesting times. I mean, web, mobile, now AI are structural inflection points. Rob, Rebecca, we're going to be at KubeCon, the CNCF. You should see the open source aspect because one of the things coming out of this innovation on AI is the open source models are merging very rapidly, but also it's fast and loose. Let right. chaos reign, then reign in the chaos, as Andy Grove once right. said. What's, what's your view on open source? Obviously, open source is the standard now for the software industry. How does open source get better in this era of <laughs> software supply chain, S-bombs, and data supply chain. Well, so it's interesting, I, I mean, just here in DC last, uh, last week, we had the uh, a, an Open Source Security Foundation Summit, and we had a, a number of people from the, uh, from the White House and DHS and other areas came and also spoke at that, and so that's been a great area of, of partnership. And we and you know, the other tech companies and other organizations continue to invest in that foundation to provide tools for the open source community. I think AI, as part of 
discovering vulnerabilities and helping people build secure code and how you get that in, out into the, ma the maintainers community is, 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 yeah. is clearly going to help the open source community. And then similarly on the open source AI models, I think you probably saw, yeah. you know, we now have some open models available in our Vertex AI model yeah, garden. Right. Uh, and I think the interesting thing is that, again, a platform basis to this is if you want to use a model, whether it's our model, a third party model, an open model, you want to use that in the context of an end to end, safe and secure, well managed AI controlled Curated, yeah. they call it curated models. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I, I think it makes sense because I also look at it yeah. and go from an attack surface perspective, AI is going to become a target. And, and I, again, I, I, it's out of, out of my head to figure out how they're going to go after it, but data has always been a place right, where right. people, but I could see where, hey, I've built, an, you know, I use an LLM for my, the CFO's group, and it has all of our jargon, and it gets people up and running really quickly. Yeah. Are you starting to see new and creative ways that people are trying to get at that data, even to, to your point about you know, poisoning it and right. things of that nature. Well, there's a lot of risks. So in, in an AI system, as you know, you can query it in certain ways to try and extract the data. You can um, inject prompts to cause the model to go make a query that it was not designed to do. There's a whole array of things. And then the security of the, of the AI system itself is very much grounded on the training data, the integrity of that the model weights, the tuning feedback, the test data, and it's interesting, so there's some types of organizations are very well attuned to thinking about end-to-end -end data control, data governance, data lineage, and there's some organizations that aren't, so some regulated industries come at the AI problem and they take a quite natural approach to it because they've been obsessed by data governance and data integrity and data lineage and test data protection over many years. Others haven't, you know, they've been maybe good at software security but not at the end to end data life cycle. Mm -hmm. So everybody's coming up that curve about AI security is this combination of software security plus data security plus the ability to test the thing end to end when it's deployed. Right. Yeah, it seems very complex and I think that's one of the places where uh, you got to take a step back. In fact, it was one of the discussions I was, again, with a different customer at the bar last night was, okay, how am I going to bring this in and secure it and make it sure? And, right. I'm like, well, how do you do that for your data today? And they're like, yeah, yeah. oh, well, because I'm like, it's data, you got to you know, yeah. put the well, regulations. Well, you know, again, this is why I think there's, and I know this is a bit of a pitch for what we do, yeah. but it's only because we've spent so many years building this stuff is, yeah. we think it just has to be a platform, yeah. and it's an integrated set of tools that do marry the data governance, the testing, the model development, the software security, and I think ultimately, just like if you took a step back and tried to develop software without an array of tools that exist today, you wouldn't be able to do it, and I think AI is the same thing, you're going to need a platform Form and a set of tools provided by an organization that's got a lot of experience in building that. Yep. Phil, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE, a really great conversation. Yep, always a pleasure, thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for John Furrier and Rob Strecce. Thank you so much for joining us at, on theCUBE's live coverage of MWISE. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>